Heidi Robertson Cooper. I serve as Senior Vice President of Healthcare Transformation at the Missouri Primary Care Association. And my name is Bob Tice. I'm the Acting CEO of Sam Lee Rogers Health Center. We partnered together mm -hmm. for this presentation. Yes, so we <coughs> are going to be sharing a unique experience, I think, between the Missouri Primary Care Association and the Health Center um, in Missouri, Sam Lee Rogers. Um, so this experience has really been a bit different than how our PCA typically interacts with customers, um, where like many PCAs, we provide technical assistance, training and education, we do advocacy, um, but this partnership is a little different. Um, so what we've done here is we have worked with Samuel U. Rogers. Um, the PCA has left this, led this effort, and essentially we have done what we're calling a rapid assessment. And this rapid assessment is um, really rooted in continuous quality improvement principles, as well has, um, has a relationship of trust, transparency, and relationship building. And so Bob and I are going to co-present this presentation so you can get perspectives from both the PCA level and also what the health center has experienced um, through this journey. And I will say that this journey is still ongoing, um, so we're, we're still in the midst of this project as we're speaking. Um, before I get into the details, I do want to thank our funders really quickly. So the Healthcare Foundation of Greater Kansas City, and also the REACH Foundation, um, also located in Kansas City, Missouri, um, has provided funding for this particular endeavor. Um, we also want to mention Michael Felix. He might not be in the room any longer. He was a part of this team, um, and he'll probably be popping in later. There he is, speak of the devil. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Felix um, was also a part of this team. I'm just uh, wishing that you were here and a part, of the, a part of the group. Okay, so with that, just a quick run through of what we're gonna talk about today. Just an overview of the PCA. Um, and then I'm going to hand it over to Bob, and he's going to talk about really what brought um, Sam Rogers to the point of this partnership. Um, then I'm going to take back over and talk about the actual process of the rapid assessment, what that looks like, all the steps we took, and that sort of thing. Um, and then we're going to go into what we actually found when we were on site going through the assessment. And then Bob will, I'll hand it back over to Bob, and he will talk about, from his perspective, what, um, what have they done with the findings and recommendations, and how have they started implementing those changes? Do I need a mic? We, we're recording. You're recording, <coughs> so I do need a mic. It's very helpful. Okay. That's fine. Right. Do you want to hand it network um, and you can also see our breakdown by payer mix here um, these are the three pillars of what we're really focusing our efforts on in Missouri um, transforming care delivery so I'm sure all of you are aware of the move to value-based payment we're in the midst of that ourselves and really working to support our health center with that transition um, advocate to improve health outcomes um, this relates to a lot of the advocacy work that we're doing internally in the state um, as well as federally, and then really sustaining um, a workforce in Missouri um, and being able to kind of move that forward in the future. So when it comes to this project, we've been hearing from our health centers, um, you know, it's just, things are tough on the ground. Um, things are constantly changing. Um, you all know recently the compliance manual has been updated, the site visits are different. Um, that's very stressful. There's more accountability. More people are asking more of our health centers. Um, they're also trying to navigate how payment changes are taking place, not only at the state level, um, but with the managed um, care organizations um, and the commercial insurers. Um, they're also being asked to deliver care in a different way. Um, and they're asking, um, all of this is being asked of them um, with the same amount of resources and uh, everyone wants more and there's not really much more given to them. 
So, you know, we know that change is really the only guaranteed thing in healthcare right now, um, and we've really been hearing this loud and clear from our health centers. Um, but in order to really meet those demands, um, we're seeing that you know health centers have to be well-oiled machines. Every part of them has to work well, operate well, everything needs to be integrated in a way that um, they can really be efficient, um, not only with their clinical care delivery, but also with what they're doing financially and operationally. And so we get this a lot. Um, we meet with our health centers um, quarterly on a um, kind of uh, aggregate basis. We bring them all together and everyone says there's so much being asked of us and we don't know where to start. And so we've really seen, you know, our role is to help them break that down a little bit to kind of support them in a way of uh, making these changes more manageable. And so this really takes us to where we've gotten with CM Rogers. So we've been hearing this from all of our health centers. You know, there's a spectrum, of course, um, I'm sure is um, the same as in your state. Um, but what we've seen is that there really needs to be kind of a fresh perspective. Um, a new set of eyes to come in and look at things and identify, you know, issues that have, they know that are there, but maybe haven't really seen them from the outside. Um, also looking at a systems approach. So instead of just looking at one siloed department or division within your health center, having someone come in and kind of look at everything and how it's interrelated. And then all with the foundation of continuous quality improvement, because health centers, um, this is woven into the fabric of what health centers do, as you all are aware. And so this is um, kind of the impetus for our relationship with Sam Rogers and the approach that we took with them. And so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Bob. He's gonna tell you a little bit about Sam Rogers um, and then we'll talk about the process more in depth. Okay, okay sure. <clears throat> Wow, how did we get here? You know what, I was excited. Uh, the head of the MPCA approached me and said, Bob, uh, we have these foundations that would like to give us some money and take a look at how, how we can make Samuel Rogers more efficient. And uh, then all these changes started happening. So first I'm gonna give you a little history of what, what Samuel Rogers, who Samuel Rogers is and uh, I'm gonna play a short video. It's a pretty cool video. We just turned 50 this year in April. So uh, I just wanna play this video and uh, give you a perspective of the legacy we're trying to fulfill. He was so unpliable to his basic dream. He just didn't think you should have to beg to help poor people. He thought that that just was a given that poor people just ought to have they had a right to good health services. He was mission driven and vision driven. And so he kept that before us, that don't forget, we're here to take care of the underserved. You know, most of the time I've heard the story tell, and people make it sound like just one day Dr. Rogers woke up and said, they could make me have a health center, you know, and it didn't quite happen like that. The thing that he was first noted for in Kansas City was suing the state of Missouri. At the time that he came to Kansas City, there were two public hospitals, general number one for whites, general number two for blacks. There was no hospital that black people go to other than General Hospital. And when they, he and his group of residents, they came together to do the residency there at the hospital, the conditions were so bad that they sued the state of Missouri. And I think that, that suit went on for about 10 years. Even though he was African American and of course had a heart and a concern for African Americans, he just cared about people. He was 50 years old when he left his practice, went back and got his master's in public health. He was already 
taking care of poor people. He had a practice with colleagues and he was taking care of people who um, probably otherwise would not have had it. But I think he got to the point where he figured that in order to take care of more people, he had to do something different. He had to be at a different level. He could see that much of the health care was complicated by the conditions around them. So when we opened up, we had a social worker, we had transportation people, and all of that was not accidental. It was because if you put a pharmacy and you don't allow them to get to the medicine, then it becomes ludicrous or at least hard to understand. Why would you even let them come to see a doctor? So that set the tone for a major social change in this community and in the nation. And I always say that Dr. Rogers was so understated because everybody thought he was a physician, but really he was the social change artist that allowed us to make everything a bit fairer. You talk about the care of others. They're the people who need, they're the people I want to care about. It was just inspiring to me to see that love. This person would come home with a stack of records and as he touched each piece of paper, he was touching a life. So that just gives you a little history. We're the fourth fairly qualified health center in the nation, first in the state of Missouri. We had a huge legacy to live up to, uh, honor, to honor the uh, legacy of Dr. Rogers. And then all this stuff started happening. Um, in 2016, I don't know if anyone used NextGen, but back in the day in 2016, NextGen they went through a new CEO, they went through a new chief IT person. Every time we did an upgrade, something, it broke two other things. So we were trying to get the, get the, uh, the faith of the people that we were supporting. So we decided we're gonna go out and change EHRs. So we went out, we changed our EHR in 2017. Uh, we changed uh, our lab provider. We went from Quest to LabCorp. We changed our outsource IT. Uh, oh, and by the way, there was leadership change. Our chief health officer left kind of right in the middle of the implementation. Then our CEO went out and they go, Bob, you're acting. <laughs> <laughs> and so I've been acting for a little while, you know, you fake it till you make it. And, uh, but we always had a solid partnership with the Missouri Primary Care Association. Uh, you know what, they have this neat annual award called the Dr. Rogers Award. NAC has a neat national award named after Dr. Rogers. Uh, they made it easy for us to ask them for help. And they were actually approaching us before any of this stuff happened. Uh, I was excited because I thought, you know what, why don't they have a physical for FQHCs? And that's kind of what I looked at this as, a physical. Let's look at governance. Let's look at finance, uh, administration. Let's look at all the different parts that we're doing and get a second opinion. Are we doing it right? Do we need to improve? And uh, especially with all these changes, uh, no one knew how to, no one was an expert at the EHR. Uh, when we first implemented it, <laughs> it was like the Wild West. At one point, uh, I had an outsourced billing company say, hey, which office visit code should we bill? <laughs> because we set it up to where the providers entered an office visit code, but there were encounter plans that other people were borrowing from other places, and it also provided an office visit code, and we go, whoa, whoa, whoa. We need to stop, figure this stuff out. We had known issues, but we, we needed a roadmap. We wanted to have someone come in and help give us a roadmap to success, a roadmap for the future. That's where Michael and Heidi came in and Joe Purley and wow, 
we had two great foundations who were, were there to make sure that we, we thrived. So through this process, it added a new perspective through different sets of eyes, and they kind of brought in a geek squad of FQHC people. But I'll let Heidi get into that. I just kind of wanted to lay the, the groundwork. We were going through a lot of things. But before we went through all these things, I always thought it would be cool to have a physical. So, Heidi. We've also heard um, this equated to a colonoscopy, not just a physical, so. <laughs> Preventative measures, either way. Um, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we actually did. Um, so the overall goal, we wanted to support their operations. Um, we wanted to approach it from a continuous quality improvement framework. Um, this was a very in-depth framework. Um, we used observations. We did a lot of um, pre-on-site work. We conducted interviews, and we looked at policies and procedures. Um, the goal was to leave this health center with practical um, and actionable, I think most importantly, recommendations for them to really support and move forward in the areas that were identified. So this is a little bit about how the process went. So we started this process about a month before we actually went on site. So um, we had a team assembled, and I'll talk about them in a little bit, but we started meeting with Bob about maybe a month and a half, and we just were having phone calls and talking about what were their needs, what were their big pain points, what were the areas that um, they really felt like they needed assistance with. We initially started this with the um, HRSA requirements in mind. We were thinking that would be a good framework to approach this. Um, but after we started talking with Bob, we realized that you know, this is more practical. You know, HRSA has their checklist and they look at specific policies and procedures, but um, they're not necessarily looking at the on the day, ground to ground work that really make the health center hum and run. And that's really what we wanted to do, and that's what Bob and his team wanted us to do. So we were meeting with Bob, and we were supporting him. Um, as he had said, there was a leadership change, and there was a little bit of, um, uh, you know, some, some changes within the health center. And so it was important that we come in um, seen as an ally and not as a group of people um, really doing an assessment and being punitive. So we were there to be a support and to help them work through issues and provide guidance, and it wasn't a, um, a, a site visit, if you will, like you would get from HRSA. Um, so we worked with Bob, and then he identified his leadership core team, and we were meeting with them, um, I would say, almost on a weekly basis before we actually came in site. Before that, um, we had them upload, I would say, almost 100 documents to a Dropbox that we were reviewing. So we were looking at financials, we were looking at policies and procedures, we were looking at all the employees that they had, um, job descriptions, um, you name it. Anything that could give us insight into um, the health center, we were asking for it. Um, and who are we? So we assembled a group of subject matter experts um, throughout the United States to really support this endeavor. So. I will go through them in the next slide, um, but they were all, for the most part, have had a role at a health center previously, um, so had the practical um, information and lived experience um, so that they could see Sam Rogers from their point of view and provide guidance. Uh, we talked a little bit about the pre-work preparations. After we had that done, we were on site for a week. So we spent Monday through Friday there, the first three days, we were meeting with staff, um, doing interviews, focus groups, really getting to know um, the organization, what they thought about it. Um, also, you know, there was a lot of change going on internally, and we were learning a lot about the culture of the organization, which really wasn't represented in any of the documents that we asked for, but was very important to our work and how we moved forward, forward with some of our work. So after that um, week-long, um, uh, meetings of um, staff and focus groups and ad hoc meetings and um, we came up, the team came up with a list of recommendations and findings. Um, and really the goal was 
to have this list, a working list, for the team at Sam Rogers to work from. And so we were able to develop that, and then also, um, we'll talk about this in a moment, but we were able to present that to the board um, so they could have buy into the process as well. Um, so this is the team that we assembled. So um, we had Heather Budd from Azara Healthcare. Our health centers in Missouri use drives, um, and it is a critical component of their quality improvement. And so we had her on board to conduct a clinical workflow mapping exercise with how they um, document in their EHR and how that translates over into UDS measures. Um, we had Michael Felix. Um, he was really the facilitator um, of this process and coordinated um, a lot of the work that we did um, internally. Um, he also conducted board meeting or board interviews. So you know, we talk, I talked a little bit about the staff we got into really deep down into the business. We had interviews with every board member. Um, he had a pretty specific list of questions that he covered and learned a lot about their perspective of the organization, where they would like to move forward, and then also current issues that were kind of going on with the organization. Um, we had Lindsay Hoslock. She is one of uh, my coworkers at the PCA. She's a nurse by training, worked at a um, community health center, and so she did some um, clinical workflow analysis in some of the clinics. Um, Joel Hughes, he is um, community lead consulting. You probably are familiar with Joel. Um, he provided some great financial insight, and really um, him and Ken spent a lot of time working on the finances and the budget. Sam Joseph, he's a physician assistant. He works at the Missouri Primary Care Association. He did a lot of the um, clinical workflow shadowing um, and that sort of thing. Joe Purley is our CEO. Um, myself, um, I worked on some of the administrative and HR work. And then Ken Stewart was a financial consultant that worked with Joel. So we broke this, um, our recommendations down into five different kind of bucket areas, if you will. Um, we had a sense of this is the direction that we were going when we entered. Um, we found that a couple of things kind of overlapped, and you'll see um, in a little bit how that looks. But when we looked at the areas, this is kind of what we were looking at. And we based this off of our conversations with Bob um, the month in advance, so we were really able to tailor what we were looking for, what we were observing, based on that pre-work. So finance, we were looking at the budget, AR, um, their billing processes, um, if they had any benchmark, financial benchmarks in place, and really their lines of business internally and um, what those look like from a financial standpoint. Um, when looking at the operational uh, operations and clinical, so they have several clinics. We were looking at all of those types of operations um, when we were doing the workflow analysis. Um, we were trying to determine how those services were integrated. Um, job roles and responsibilities was a big issue that came up. Um, that was something they want us to look very closely at. The EHR, Bob has alluded to some trouble points there. Um, that's something we spent a lot of time discussing. And then um, some of the intra-organizational referrals or the cross-pollination between dental, WIC, PEDS, that sort of thing. And then really digging into the clinic, um, the clinical and the workflow. So um, as we mentioned, Heather Budd was there and she did um, a two-day um, in-depth workshop that they went through uh, all the UDS measures to identify where they were documenting, where they should be documenting, and if data was actually pulling through like they thought. Um, we shadowed the clinic workflow in um, the PEDS, um, the women's health, and family. Um, we also took a really close look at their care team composition. Um, they really have, I would say, a pretty progressive care team model. Um, in Missouri, we have a health home program where we get, the health centers get a PMPM payment um, for a care manager and a behavioral health consultant. They've decided to expand that to another clinic that didn't actually qualify for those payments, so they've taken that on themselves. Um, we wanted to take a closer look at that. And then also, you know, they do have this population health team. How well do they work within the clinic workflow? 
um, administrative and community building. So this is where we were really looking at the organization overall. We were looking at um, all the, the job roles and descriptions. Um, we were looking internally at the culture because things were in flux with leadership. Um, we really wanted to get a sense of what, how everyone was feeling internally with that. Um, compliance issues, we were looking at HR processes. And then another big thing, um, we wanted to know really where Sam Rogers, what their view was um, in the community. What was their um, reputation like? Um, what have they been doing to get out in the community and partner with others? Um, and so we took a close look at that. And then last, I mentioned earlier, we um, really dug deep into the board. Um, we had board calls before we were on site. We met with the board um, at their board meeting. We looked at really all the things HRSA looks at, but we also looked for some understanding um, from the board if they really knew what a health center was and um, what their roles and responsibilities were. So when looking at the actual process, I mentioned we were there for a week. So Monday through Wednesday, we spent time on the ground with staff, meeting, learning, and just soaking everything in. Um, we also spent Wednesday afternoon developing our recommendations. Um, we spent Thursday working with staff. So after we had our list of recommendations, we had a half day meeting with the staff and told them what we found. Um, none of it was a surprise, um, but that I think was a very helpful um, way to move forward with this process because we were able to have a conversation about everything that was found um, and could have just an open dialogue, which was unusual for them because they hadn't had that type of environment before. Um, and then with that uh, meeting, we wanted to leave with three or four top priorities where they really needed to focus their time, energy, and effort because we were going to present that to the board on that Friday. And so that is what we did to end the week. Um, the staff had made their priorities. Um, we assigned tasks um, and roles to carry those out. And then on Friday, we uh, presented that to the board so there was some accountability at all levels. And then really our work was done on site for that week, but our work actually hasn't stopped. So I will keep mentioning that you know, this process is really founded on continuous quality improvement um, we're still meeting with Sam Rogers monthly. Um, we're there for about a half a day on site. We are working through the list of recommendations, getting progress updates, um, working through barriers and challenges, because um, it's not as clean as you would hope it to be. Um, but you know, the MPCA is committed you know, moving forward through this process. Uh, we do have funding through July. Um, so officially, all our work will end there, but um, knowing that the progress that has taken place with Sam Rogers to this, um, to this point, um, I don't see us really um, backing off. Okay, any questions? I'm gonna pause for a second. Any questions about the actual process and what we were looking at um, and the method before I move on to, go ahead. Did you have a template or something you were following, or did you kind of create this yourself? We created it ourselves. So as I said, we were starting to look at the HRSA requirements, and when we were talking to Bob and his team, it just, they weren't the right fit. Um, they wanted to know, you know, why um, their registration process was breaking down. Um, not necessarily did they have a registration policy. Um, so it was much more granular. I mean, of course we looked at the policies and procedures, but there really wasn't anything out there that we could find to a T that we could really follow. Um, and so we tailored it to their needs specifically. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So I'll tell you what we found. Um, so this is like lifting up the hood. This is probably the colonoscopy part. Um, so again, I'm going to break it down into our five different areas. Um, this was the format of the report. There's a, a long word document that essentially we looked at the goal, we had observations listed, we listed out our recommendations, um, we had our action owners who was going to take ownership of this after we left, 
and then you can see progress, that's where we fill in um, in our monthly check-in meetings on how they've moved forward. One thing that I don't think you see on this particular table, um, if there was an area for technical assistance that was needed, um, that would be indicated on this table, and we had some funding to support some of that technical assistance in certain areas. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as like priority or, or commitment around timelines, mm -hmm. does that live elsewhere? So we'll, <laughs> we'll talk about um, the priorities kind of after I go through. Um, so in the document, they, we have color coded the priorities that their team had identified. So they're in bright red. Um, and so yes, that is indicated on the document. Okay, so what we learned in terms of the financial aspects is that when they switched to this new EHR, the billing process went haywire. Um, this is not my area of expertise, but I know that um, this was a huge pain point for them, and we really found that they needed to revamp their internal billing processes. And so this was an area that we were able to provide some technical assistance to have someone come in, look at their new EHR, um, and kind of uncover a new process, train their employees, build that capacity um, so they can move forward and um, actually bill for the care that they're delivering. Um, there were some issues around cost report um, and some of the effectiveness around that. We provided some technical assistance with that as well. Um, roles and responsibilities, this will come up a couple of times, but having clear, um, defined roles and responsibilities for um, staff in the billing department, and then really optimizing that cross-pollinization um, for in-house referrals, so making sure that the patient is seen in peds, they're uh, being seen in dental, and vice versa. For the clinical and operations recommendations, I think the EHR optimization was um, top of the list, <laughs> I would say. It's something that is still being discussed today. This, th we spent a lot of time on this, and they spent a lot of time on this. Um, Bob didn't get a, a lot of history, um, but a new EHR was implemented really without any due diligence. Um, and he had mentioned that uh, key figures had left in the middle of implementation. So it wasn't implemented um, like you would hope in a health center or any healthcare setting. Um, so Bob was really left to try to figure out what to do next. And they were at the point of, do we stay with this vendor that we have now? Or do we go back to next gen? Or do we look at another vendor? And so they did go through a very thoughtful um, process to determine what should we do? What, what do they need? Um, what should they do moving forward? And ultimately, they did decide to stay with the vendor they have now and um, rely on some technical assistance to really optimize um, how they are using that EHR, where to document. And that has been, that has been helpful, and we've seen some progress in our um, update meetings. Um, this kind of falls in that um, structured training to improve standard and efficiency. Um, they haven't really had a operations person in place to focus on this and so we recognized that that was a gap and a barrier um, different staff were doing things in a different way where it should be standardized um, there were some unnecessary documentation requirements um, that were in place um, their population health management team they had a robust team but they were not integrated into uh, the primary care clinic so if there was a patient that needed a care manager, the, the provider did not know really how to contact a care manager to come in. So they had this great team of resources available and well, ready and willing, but there was not any interrelated um, workings there to get them to kind of mesh as a team. And then, um, you know, goal setting um, is a part of, I would say, the fabric of quality improvement in what health centers are doing. Um, but there really wasn't a look at health equity and looking at um, essentially, you know, are certain patients of different backgrounds getting a different experience of care? And Sam Rogers is a very diverse health center. 
Um, they serve a very large refugee population, um, non-English speaking, and so it was important to us from the outside looking to make sure that, in fact, you know, are all of your patients receiving um, the same level of care? Clinical workflow, this relates to some of the um, work around Azara and drives. Um, there were a lot of issues around this, um, but one thing that I will say around this, um, there was a dedicated team that really wants to figure this out, and they have made a lot of progress around documentation, cleaning up data in the EHR, um, and really making sure that the care teams have information to arm them with as the patient comes in, so they're able to provide proactive and planned care. Uh, on the administrative and community building, um, health equity was a key principle that uh, we realized that would really benefit the health center. Um, and also, you know, there was a, a very large uh, leadership change, and we were seeing that on the ground, and the fatigue that we were seeing from staff around the changes that were being made and some of the uncertainty. And so we really encouraged um, Sam Rogers to put in place a thoughtful um, plan to address the cultural changes that needed to take place. Um, community relationships, those were suffering. Um, there were a lot of um, rumors going around um, in the community about Sam Rogers and uh, we really recommended that Bob get out in the community and talk with partners, and he certainly has done that. Um, their leadership structure was something that, um, for a long time, the CFO and COO held the same role. Um, and as you can imagine, those are two big roles. And so there was a gap on the operational level. And so we recommended hiring a operations director um, to support some of that on the ground, um, in the clinic, kind of day-to-day -day stuff that was kind of being looked over. Um, they, had a, they have a foundation. Um, they have a board that runs the foundation. There was some confusion between what the foundation does and the regular board. Um, and so we really asked for some clarity around that. Um, and then an overall benchmarking process. And then last, there's a lot here for the board, um, but really what was uncovered is they were unclear um, about their role as a board member. Um, and when a health center is going through a pretty tremendous change with the leadership turnover, um, you know, we felt like this was a, a very critical part that we wanted to focus on. Um, so we recommended a board retreat, um, really um, interweaving the culture um, and transforming the culture into the organization and what their role is for that, um, making sure that they knew that benchmarks um, and that process should be in place and they should be looking at those, uh, looking at job description, goals on board education, um, looking at the relationship between the health center board and the foundation board, revamping an onboarding process for new members, um, reviewing the board selection process, and then also reviewing the board's self-evaluation process. And so this brings us to what were the top areas that um, Sam Rogers, their staff, their leadership selected. And the first one, um, in no particular order really, um, they wanted to focus on the AR and the revenue cycle management because they were seeing a decrease in obviously money coming in and they need that to operate. Um, also the EHR workflow and optimization and standardization. So going back, how do we use that EHR that we're stuck with now? How do we optimize and make that really work for us? Um, the executive roundtable meetings. So this goes to the cultural transformation that um, I mentioned earlier. So this is a strategy that Bob is deploying that really um, is trying to build and garner trust within the organization um, due to the leadership change. And these are small groups where he's meeting with them, kind of a cross-functional group, and just listening, asking questions and listening. And then last, um, this also goes to the cultural transformation, but looking at health equity, and also um, introducing trauma-informed care to their workforce. And both of those things have been, um, they're being implemented right now. Any questions over the findings? And now I'm 
um, because if no questions, I'm going to hand it over to Bob and he's going to talk about how they've been implementing these recommendations. All right. So all that and then last Thursday, our HRSA site visit. We had an operational site visit team last Thursday. Uh, they finally left and uh, got to read that guide, you know, that, that new operational site visit guide. It's, it's incredible. It is incredible. It literally tells you everything you need to do. It's kind of like the UDS. Um, when I first took over UDS, I didn't even know there were instructions for UDS because no one ever shared them. It's important to read the instructions. So this operational site visit thing, I'm gonna tell you two lessons I learned. Um, we had two findings in two areas. And one, whenever you have a contracted services, I think it's in column three, where uh, the patient has to pay for it. The health center is not paying for it, but you have to pay for it. Or sorry, the patient has to pay for it. You have to make sure that there is specific sliding fee information. So I'm just going to talk about that. Make sure, uh, this is what I just learned, make sure that in your contracts you have sliding fee information and it has to be detailed and how it mirrors your sliding fee. Uh, the other thing that we, we got ding dong is uh, another thing about contracts. Uh, you have to make sure that uh, the credentialing process is laid out in the contract that whoever you're partnering with, so in, in our terms, it was a hospital. We had to make sure that all their, they had a credentialing process that was clearly defined in the contract. So after all this, only two findings, right? And so uh, they, I have the wording, I have the contract out to our, uh, our community partner Truman Medical Center, the, the main hospital that we send many of our referrals. Hopefully we'll get those checked off in the next couple of days, but wow, it's been a journey. Um, data, data is so important. Uh, it, it, Azara, you guys are gonna love Azara if you, if you haven't had it. Uh, I was talking a little bit earlier today about, you know what's on the quiz? But until you get your data back, you don't know if you're doing it right. So you may be answering the same question incorrect every single time, or you may have placed it in the wrong place every single time. But uh, when you have data in front of your face, it, then you can, wow, make better decisions. So EMR optim optimization. Wow, we didn't even know if we were going to stick with Athena. We were thinking that we can't get it to work. 5% of health centers, federally qualified health centers, are on Athena. So I kind of felt like we were on the bleeding edge of technology. Um, so we didn't necessarily know the right questions to ask. We didn't have any next-gen experts like we did in the past. We had next-gen experts. Uh, now we were using Athena. So we didn't have any experts. We didn't know the right questions to ask. We set up an EHR evaluation process and wow, we were meeting weekly and sometimes a couple times a week and, and uh, just to see if we should go in a new direction. And eventually we decided, you know, looking at all the, uh, all the things we've been through you only have so much energy and time to uh, switch, you know. Once you get in good habits, you, you, you want to get into good habits so you have the energy to handle the things that are outside the regular pattern. So we went through another thing, that EHR evaluation process. It's like, wow, we were doing it for months, looking to see. And then we were finally able to get our UDS data out. And then uh, we were talking to people and they go, you know what, all these EHRs are the same. There's not, there's not a perfect EHR. Um, before we switched EHRs, with uh, the help of the MPCA and Drives and Azara and all that good stuff, all of a sudden we became a health center quality leader. 
which that puts us in the top third of all health centers in the nation. And it's like, Joe Purley, the head of the MPCA, said, uh, why are you guys changing? <laughs> so it's like, why, why were we changing? So I'll get to that part in just a minute. <clears throat> um, making the EHR work for us. There's this place called Hudson Headwater. It's in New York. They're number one at everything they do. Uh, they have 125,000 patients. They're the first health center on Athena. They already learned the workarounds that they had to do. We were just trying to, we were still knocking our head against the wall saying, uh, what do we need to do? Are, are there workarounds that we need to do? Just need to accept? Data cleanup. You know what? We had a whole team that was revalidating everything we did. Are we putting it in the right place so we can pull the, the right information? Uh, we, we made a decision to bring over um, all the old diagnoses for, I think that's what it's called, diagnoses for patients. And uh, so if someone had, um, what is that, asthma? What, what do they call it? That chronic or persistent asthma. Uh, it came over, and uh, so it was officially in Athena, but if the patient really didn't have it or that was resolved, we got a ding on the UDS report because uh, luckily our good physicians wouldn't prescribe asthma medication for them because they no longer had that condition. So we had a lot of data to clean up, and uh, believe me, once you know your data, you can do so many different things. Uh, I, I was talking a little bit earlier. That I think we, we only have like 200 patients with that chronic or persistent asthma. And with, with knowing our data now, it's 30 people. So we can reach out to those 30 people who didn't have the asthma medicine prescribed to them get them to come back in and prescribe that medication to be at 100%. But there were some of those that we brought over from the old system that we could never fix, so. Data, adopt best practices, you know? Uh, we, we always wanna find out the best way to do things. That sharing, sharing best practices, that's what it's all about with FQHCs. If you know something, if you know how to, how, how to do diabetic education, how to make someone change their lifestyle, share that with everyone. So adopt best practices, figure it out, have the workflows, standardize document, documentation practices across the team, across practices. Holy cow, we had four people doing prenatal care and they all did it differently. They all ordered different labs for everything. It's like. Can't we agree to order the same labs and have it all set up so it makes everyone's life easier? That the poor MA had to figure out who she was working for today and what did they want to do differently than, than what everyone else did. Technical assistance. Finally, we were, we were at the right place after being in, in Athena for eight, nine, ten months when this rapid assessment was going, we finally knew better questions to ask. Because you don't necessarily know the right questions to ask. So it's the salesman telling you this thing can do everything. You don't have to switch EHRs to go through this process. You know, it's, a, it's about having someone else, another set of eyes to look at what you're doing. See if you can do it better. Uh, at one point in NextGen, uh, after coming back from MPCA meetings, people kept on saying, with NextGen, you can't use Azara. Nope, we just weren't using it correctly. So having someone who knows what they're doing look at the process, and we worked with Azara one-on-one, -on -one, and uh, we were able to put things in the right place so it could be pulled correctly. And this is still a work in process. You know what, there isn't one perfect EHR. I've learned that in interviews. Uh, 
we were going through this whole process to see if we were going to change. And uh, I go, nope, we're not changing. I, I know we just spent four months looking through everything, but as the acting CEO, I said, we're not changing because there is no perfect DHR. Um, we still needed to learn this. Oh, by the way, when I told the board that we were thinking about changing, I swear I think some, a couple of them were gonna come up and punch me in the face. <laughs> Change fatigue is a real thing. I was talking to other chief operating officers, so there are two or three FQHCs in the state of Missouri who all went to Athena. I'm not saying it's Athena. I'm not saying it's just an Athena thing. It's any change. But they all started saying, <laughs> did everyone forget what they used to do? I mean, in, in NextGen, everyone knew how to do the sliding fee. In Athena, everyone forgot how to do it. Family size and income. Know your data. Read the directions. There's usually some directions out there that will help make life a little bit easier. Once you can read, your, read those, understand the best way to do it, you put it here so you can pull it here. Trust but verify. Those salesmen tell you everything. You want to make sure <laughs> that you are always verifying that something can do what it says it can do. Do your homework. There is no magic. This is, whoa. Uh, the, well, the, the next two things. There is no magic. I don't like magic. I, I'm a CFO. I want to understand the process. I was a CFO, then COO, and now acting CEO. It's like, there's some magic. If you don't understand it, you better ask the right questions. You better figure out what are they talking about. And don't just nod, because <laughs> we have some patients. We, we serve 38 different languages. And our providers know when people are nodding yes to not a yes or no question. So make sure there's understanding. And the biggest lesson I learned, the biggest one, be the voice of skepticism. You might be the one left implementing. The people who chose it left. They left. I, I'm going, hey, you know what? <laughs> we'll figure it out. We'll figure out the billing. Well, the billing was a nightmare to start with. Um, so uh, be careful. If someone decides they want to go into another direction, ask the questions. Ask the hard questions. Um, that was a nightmare. Our C chief health officer left, our CEO left, and my board is looking at me going, why didn't you fix everything? It's been nine months. It's a process. Accounts receivable and billing. You know what, at, at the beginning, uh, we, we used a different outsourced billing company as training wheels, thinking they would help us and we could always add more people or take more people down because it was a contract. They weren't really adding value. They were just, they were just uh, not doing what we needed them to do. Let's just say it like that. Is it a process? You know what, if you don't provide clear direction, people are gonna make up a process. Clear direction is the key to everything. Sometimes resistance to change is not that someone doesn't wanna do it, it's because they don't know how to do it. So make sure that you have clear direction. Clear de delineation of roles and responsibilities. You know, Heidi was talking about operations. At one point, <laughs> The chief health officer who left was in charge of providers, IT, the front desk, the practice managers, <laughs> everything. He goes, it all relates to the care we give. And it's like, and, and then he left. <laughs> and then we had to rebuild and re-put things together. Salespeople are salespeople. Question everything. I'm going to go back to there's no magic. 
we decided to bring billing back in house. Our salesperson told us, oh, you won't need any billing staff. This, this thing works incredible. <laughs> you need, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we need a billing staff. And you know what? Don't lose money because of billing. Uh, you know, there were so many things. It was the Wild West. We didn't, they weren't closing encounters. They didn't know how to close encounters. Then when we got them to close encounters, uh, our MAs and LPNs still had to put orders in, right? How do you put orders in into a closed encounter? Well, you have to reopen up something else and let's get a process down. Let's give clear direction. No money, no mission, more money, more mission. You need to cross train. <laughs> we didn't think we had to have billing staff, but at one point we had one biller in house who was doing credentialing, answering billing questions. Oh, by the way, she's also sitting in meetings for 10 hours a week. This person was a little bit stressed out, missing emails, not responding. Don't let a forty, fifty thousand dollar employee sink the ship. Now we're not sinking, but I'm just saying cross train, cross train, cross train. Double check everything. I feel like I've said this fifty times already, but read the direction and create clear processes and procedures. That is the key. Dig into the dig into the data. If you don't know what's going wrong or what's going on with billing, who does? Who's going to be the expert out there? Who's going to show that little curiosity to dig in to see why Dennis X hasn't been paid for anything? Uh, you, you have to know your data. Billing, encounters, clinical. Sometimes great employees get overwhelmed and don't always tell you. Or if they do, you don't always hear them because they're your great employees. They're the ones you trust with everything. They've never let you down in the past. Unfortunately, I've had a 12-year employee who was awesome, and I thought, wow, she never did anything wrong. She, she ended up leaving us. And, and I'm very sad about that. So, Organizational culture. Wow, communication. Be transparent. Tell everyone where, you're, where you are. CEO roundtables, give people a chance to talk back. Give people a chance to be heard. Sometimes all people want to do is just be heard. Let them know they have a voice. Strategic plan. So the cool thing is we developed a new strategic plan. We incorporated many elements of the rapid assessment. We looked at our old strategic plan. Uh, we conducted board surveys. And so that helped create the new strategic plan. And it's going to take us in the right place. It's all measurable data, um, all good stuff. Board governance. You know what? Sometimes. Boards don't know how to advocate on your behalf. One of the things that we need to do, one of the things that I need to do, is make it very easy for them to go out and say a 30 minute elevator speech. Make that 30 minute elevator speech, sorry, 30 second. Make that, <laughs> if you're in 30, an elevator for 30 minutes, no one's gonna have a good time. <laughs> um, let everyone know what to do, uh, communication, the key to everything. Trauma-informed care. The one thing we learned about trauma-informed care, so we, we, we we're working with this Georgetown University, they're coming out, they're talking to all of our uh, employees, and the first thing this person said at an all-staff meeting was everyone's trying to do the best they can. If you start from that fact, everyone's trying to do the best they can, then maybe you're not giving the clear direction and the feedback to get the results that you need. So trauma-informed care, you know, we don't need to think of our patients as another thing, another, another task we have to get through that day. It's putting ourselves in their situation. Understand that everyone goes through trauma. Understanding that, you know what, 
we better not have a policy that says if you're 10 minutes late and a mom had to take three buses to get here and she's 15 minutes late, we say, you're going to have to reschedule. You know, we have to think. Uh, transportation is one of the most difficult things for our patients. Organizational culture. Constantly bring it back to the mission. You know what? We're here to, at Sam Rogers. We're here to provide high quality, compassionate, and affordable health care for all. I think that's what we're all trying to do. Make sure that everyone has the care they need to thrive. Get rid of the pot stirs. Oh my God, we had some pot stirs. <laughs> if you can get rid of the pot stirs and make sure everyone's pulling the same direction, it sure makes life a lot easier. Drama, drama. You know what? <laughs> we have enough to do without dealing with all the drama and the pot stirs and going, they don't know, this person doesn't know what to do. <laughs> Help them. Make it easy for your board to support you. Identify the tools they need by asking them. You know what, in our board survey, what kind of education do you need? What do you need to be a better advocate? Uh, in, the, in our strategic plan, we're, we're going to have who attended what board meetings, right? Who attended what committee meetings? Did you donate? Have you invited anyone into the health center to give a tour? Create a team atmosphere. You know what? Everyone wants to know that their opinion counts. Everyone. Uh, when it came down to the, are we going to switch EHRs or not? I did have to put my foot down and say, oh, we can't do it. We just can't do it. There are too many reasons why we can't do it. And, uh, but otherwise, I want to try and get consensus on everything we do. Try. Not everyone's always going to agree with everything you do, but you want to try. <clears throat> Staff are, <laughs> and another thing, right, clear direction. Staff are going to get it done whether or not you provide clear direction. You don't tell people how to do the slide, and if you're not auditing the slide. When I first got to this place, um, 17 out of 30 slides were incorrect when our auditors looked at it. You know, okay, we're going to have to put an internal audit process together. Then it was 10 out of 30. Then it was 5 out of 30. Then it was... Four out of 40, and finally we got it down. And uh, believe it or not, the staff go, thank you. Because as new staff came on, they understood what other people were doing. Because they were actually auditing each other. That trauma-informed care, everyone is doing the best they can. Woo. <laughs> Overall takeaway, clear direction helps with everything. Clear direction helps with everything. Trauma-informed care. Everyone is trying to do the best they can. Education. Education is the key to everything we do. I, I, I looked at uh, a patient's information. Their A1C was 11.4 in February. I looked in July. It was 7.3. I go, what the hell did we do? It was education. We provided them the tools they needed. They were in the right spot to make the changes they need. Education, always teach. and Teach everyone to know the whys so that when something out of the ordinary happens, they can address it. I was an auditor at one time, and how they taught me how to audit was, here you go, do it same as last year. So Sally, same as last year. You know, it, just put the tick marks the same way. But teach the wise. Accountability. So that's what, that's what Heidi and Michael do. They come back and they ask, where are you? Where are you with this? And where are you with this? And where are you with this? Uh, this isn't a plan that just sits on the, on the corner of our desk and, and we'll get to it, right? They're coming back. I know they're coming back on a monthly basis asking us, where are you? What have you done? So they're holding us accountable. I'm holding uh, the leadership team accountable. We're making real progress. 
Stop creating robots. Holy cow. <laughs> the third floor told us what to do. We're not doing it unless the third floor tells us what to do. We created so many robots that if people saw something wrong, they didn't say anything. They're saying, you guys told us how to do it. So we needed to stop creating robots, empowering teams to, to give them a voice in what they're doing. Get everyone involved in offering insight into relationship building. You know, uh, I'm out talking to schools. I'm out talking to council, mem council members of the Kansas City, Missouri government. <laughs> Count, county council members, I'm talking to CEOs of hospitals. What can we do together? How can we partner? How can we make life better for the people we serve? Identify bright spots so that you can duplicate them. Uh, you know what? See who's doing diabetic care the best. Copy them. Provide feedback, provide recognition and training opportunities. <laughs> I have one person at the health center who, who isn't the best at Excel. She enters a column of numbers, and then to get the total, she gets her calculator out and adds them all up and enters the total. <laughs> train people, train people. Get out in the community and share the great things you're doing. So I want to just talk about one of the great things we're doing. Uh, on the HRSA site visit, they have this thing is, uh, what is something transformational? I think it's the very last thing on the HRSA site visit that they ask. What are you, what's a transformational uh, practice that you're doing? So we partnered with uh, this company called Circulation. Circulation is an app that we send out to our patients. And uh, in the early days, it would, they would, uh, we partnered with Uber and Circulation. We can get someone to the health center. If they call in at noon, we can get them to a one o'clock appointment. Circulation. We had the, the one of the foundations pi uh, gave us funding for a pilot project. Oh my God, people are able to make their appointments. They're able to schedule a same day appointment and be there within the hour. And you know what? We used to have a van, but our van could only go so many different places. And uh, then all the patients had to wait until everyone was done with their visit. With this circulation thing, all they have to do is enter a code and the car comes back and picks them up and takes them back home. So we're respecting our patient's time. We're removing the barrier of transportation to care. And we're paying for it. But it's paying for itself. And we have fewer no-shows for it. Develop a communication strategy for staff, community partners, funders. Tell your story or others will tell it for you. Uh, this f next, not this Wednesday, but the following Wednesday, we're having an all-staff training where we're going to go into eight different rooms and learn what we do. This is what WIC does, right? This is what dental does. Did you know that dental disease is 100% preventable? This is what PEDS does. This is why you need a well visit. We're, we're going to create salespeople out of our staff and make sure that they're all doing it the right way. Don't let the plan gather dust. Wow. And I always go back to it to see if you're on track. Uh, Heidi's boss, Joe Purley, he always asks me, and he still asks me, every time he sends it out to somebody. Uh, you know, when I first saw the plan, I go, wow, I didn't know we were doing that bad. But <laughs> he's sending out the rapid assessment to people, and it's like, I go, ugh, I feel a little bit naked, you know? They're, they're, uh, Showing warts and all, and uh, but share, share with everyone because if you do something, this whole process is making us better, making us more accountable, 
to our funders, to HRSA, to our patients, to each other. Be wise, know your strengths and weaknesses. Know when to help, when to ask for help. You know, that's what King Solomon always preached. Be wise, you know what? Know when to ask for help. I knew when to ask for help. <laughs> this is crazy, come help me. Seek out best practices. Always be curious and learn more. That intellectual curiosity, you always wanna learn more. You always wanna learn the best way to do it. Okay. Woo. <laughs> so now we're gonna open it up to you all to see if you have any questions for us about the process. Um, from the health center perspective, from the PCA perspective. I have a quick question for you all. A uh, raise of hand, who works at a health center? Okay. And then PCA staff? Okay. So from a health center perspective, um, what does this process feel like to you? Is it invasive? Would it be helpful? Just interested in some feedback generally. We had some of those challenges, of course, um, that, that especially that when we changed when we changed from NextGen to Athena, a lot of the processes changed for our uh, HIM staff. And so uh, we tried to, to realize that that was occurring and, and gave them extra attention. Um, 
but it, that is that's a challenge everywhere in, in making sure that people are provided feedback and that they have help and that they feel comfortable uh, and so I'm going to talk about something that's not related to this at all my mom worked at a department store for 30 years and the worst week of her life was every time they changed systems and it's like oh my god she had to relearn a new system but you have to make sure that everyone's everyone is moving forward I hate to say no child left behind because that's a George Bush thing but <laughs> no no staff member left behind how about that uh, I think that probably the long term study the follow-up quarterly meetings would help you keep people on track if they went off track so from your rapid cycle review mm -hmm. but I do have sort of a basic question so did Samuel Samuel Rogers is yes. that right? health center did they pay the PCA to do this or was it funding mm -hmm. outside funding that they yes. funded? So we received around $150,000 from our local foundations in the Kansas City area okay. um, to fund this particular project. Um, initially, some of the planning, we did use some of our base grant funding because it fit into what we had included on our work plan. But this is very time intensive, um, staff intensive work. We, you know, we hired consultants to come in. Um, it would be from a PCA perspective, we have some other health centers in the state that are looking for um, some similar assistance and we are looking for funding because it's, it's just a lot of work and time and planning and preparation. Um, we've, we're seeing a lot of value in it, but we don't internally have the funding to do that. And, and the outcomes, have you seen a financial turnaround? Or? We're still working on the financial turnaround. Okay. Uh, it, we're, we're just rebuilding our billing team right now. So uh, we will see it. Uh, we are definitely seeing, it. you know what? Uh, the, the cool thing is that we were a health center quality leader before we made this switch. I think we're still gonna be a health center quality leader after in the first year of a new EHR. And that's because of getting processes in place, revalidating the data, so. Yeah, and I think, um you know, we're looking for those metrics to know how has this intervention worked? And I think, you know, there are some things we can point to. Um, you know, your AR is going down. Um, there are, there's more of a team cohesiveness within the organization. The culture seems to be shifting in the right direction. Um, in the community, uh, there were severed relationships before Bob took over the acting CEO role. He has been out in the community. The rumors have kind of slowed down. Um, they are much more visible, knowing that they are around and going to stay and they are a partner. And so those are more of the qualitative things that we can point to right now that is showing you know, that we feel like this work has been valuable to some extent and we hope to have more information um, and more data going forward. Go ahead. Did you set up those So no, we didn't. We kind of went in saying, you know, I felt like every meeting, and maybe you could attest to this a little bit, um, there was a different thing to focus on. So, you know, we knew we, we wanted to go in and kind of help stabilize things. We didn't necessarily know what those metrics would look like. And so as we conducted our check-in meetings, we spent a lot of time initially up front on Athena. Are they gonna stay or are they gonna go? Um, and we spent a lot of time on that. Um, so there wasn't necessarily a metric around that. I think in hindsight, we certainly should have approached it a little differently and had maybe some you know, generic um, kind of cross-sectional metrics that we could have looked at around you know, going into it, we knew billing was an issue um, and some other things. So I think that's one thing that I would have personally done differently, setting up this approach. Some of the metrics, actually, I don't think I want to look back on. Because <laughs> there are some scary things. The state of Missouri is cost-based reimbursed. So 
we had a huge denial rate for our billing. And just to put it in perspective, a 1% change in our medical billing, as we're cost-based reimbursed, is $100,000. A 1% change in our dental billing is $40,000. Uh, and, and believe me, a lot more people in the health center know those statistics now. And if we, it, I'm, I'm even scared to say what our dental denial rate was because it was horrible. <laughs> and so that, that's where credentialing, uh, we had a credentialer that was overwhelmed and we had a couple new dentists come on and, and she wasn't able to respond because she was in these, in every meeting and uh, uh, by the way, she, she <laughs> has kids <laughs> and has a, a life at home and um, wow, that we put way too much on one person and, and uh, that one person really costs us, I'm not, I'm not trying to blame her at all, we, we put her in a bad situation. And so um, that's one thing that we did learn. It has to be cross-training. There has to be someone who can pick up where someone left off. But in the strategic plan that we have, we have all sorts of metrics. So uh, we have turnover, we have AR, days in AR, denial rates, it, the, the time it takes to close an encounter. Uh, there's all sorts of staff turnover. So there's all sorts of good metrics that are out there that we can easily, uh, we can look at turnover and we can go back in time if we have to do that. We can go back in time and look at denial rates because that's gonna be a story I'm gonna tell later down the road. Uh, our health center, it, it, you, sometimes you don't know how much change you've, you've actually, that has occurred until you look back. So I look back at 10 years ago. 10 years ago, 58% of our patients were uninsured, 58%. I look back at the kids, 35% of our kids were uninsured. It's like, okay, let's put something else together. With CHIP going up to 300% of poverty, um, now we're down to 6% for kids that are uninsured. Uh, our, our overall uninsured rate is 35%, but you have to put things in place in order for them to change, otherwise you're your results are, what, what do they say? The results you're, you're achieving are perfectly designed, no, your, what is it? Your processes and procedures are perfectly designed to get the results you're currently getting. So you have to change those in order to get different results. Sometimes you have to change people. Uh, sometimes we had a couple employees that we had to put in different roles because they weren't necessarily the best person in this role, so we moved them into another role. And it, it's not moving a problem. My, the, worst, the last thing I'd ever want to do is move one problem employee to a different area to cause problems in that area. But we moved a couple employees around to where now they're thriving and they're helping us achieve great results. We actually got a $30,000 grant for that. 30000 So have you been able to determine uh, who would value uh, those improved outcomes so they could be considered uh, to help reimburse for those services, or does the state of Missouri? So the state of Missouri reimburses uh, 50 per so. So we have whatever percent of Medicare, uh, sorry, of Medicaid we are, the state of Missouri will reimburse that in transportation. So then we also have other grants too that uh, if there's a no-show, so we have some behavior health funding, that if there's a no-show, we can't bill for that service. So I would rather pay the $10 to get someone here than have that spot go unused and not get anything. It's like a hotel vacancy rate, right? That you don't want your vacancy to be 
40% when you know <laughs> that you need every room filled because that's what people need. So, so it's helping us with the no-show and, and we're able to build other things because of it. Time for one last question. Well, thank you. Make sure and complete your evaluations. Please take the time to do that. It helps influence and, and uh, our planning for next year. So just leave them on the table, and I'll go around and pick them up. Thank you. The next session in here for quality is at 3.30.